Pokemon is a series that is very close to my heart. It has its age, it's been around the block. 25 years is pretty old for a franchise. And with Scarlet Violet coming out, good luck. I wanted to talk about and reminisce about the older games. Even though I might not have played all of those, I wanted to reminisce on the older generations of how we got to where we are today. See, what has changed over the last 25 years of Pokemon? Pokemon Red, Blue, Green, Yellow. This was basically the starter pack edition of the series. This is where it all started. The first 151 Pokemon, as basic as it gets. We got Team Rocket, you had Blue Rose Arrival, Special Attack and Special Defense were just one thing. So, Pokemon with high special stat, that's what it's called, special, and then high speed were just outright broken in the game because they could take hits and they will just outspeed you and do a lot of damage. So, so Mewtwo was kind of busted in that game because special attack and special defense was one. And as you know, Mewtwo has high special. <laughs> Pokemon Yellow didn't really change much later on the timeline when that came out, but it did replace your starter Pokemon with Pikachu and some of the team Rocket Runs with Jesse and James. That was kind of a cool feature, but that's all that really happened because of it. Gold, Silver, and Crystal. This was the next step in the evolution of Pokemon. Generation 2, baby! Holy shit, there are a lot of changes. For one, Special was split into two stats. Special Attack and Special Defense was born. Fucking divorce, just like my parents. <laughs> there were a lot of changes between the first generation and the second generation. So Team Rocket makes a comeback. This And thankfully, balance-wise, they split Special Attack. And special defense into two different things. So the special stat was no more, it was now two stats. Thank fucking god for that, because I <laughs> that might have been kind of crazy if you put it in modern terms now. Held items are introduced. New Pokemon. You can go back to Kanto in the post game. You can fight red in the post game. Your mom will take over a financial account and be in an unhealthy <laughs> relationship with you. <laughs> in the post game, you got to go back to Kanto, get the Dojin badges again, and then fight red. Which was honestly a cool ass bar fight if you just go into the game blind and don't know about beforehand. You got a radio, so you got you can just switch to different songs all around the uh, Johto region and just jam out to different beats. Apricorns also were introduced in this game, which honestly was a, is a neat feature. It allows you to create new Pokeballs by talking to the Apricorn guy, but that's about it. Didn't really change the game that much, other than having star points to your Pokemon. And, more importantly, the Dark and Steel type was introduced. All around, Gen 2 for Gold, Silver, and Crystal were pretty decent add-ons to the game. New Pokemon, substantial balance changes, allows you to revisit the old region, and overall quality of life changes. Nice. Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald. Even though there weren't a lot of notable changes, there was a big change, and that was the introduction of abilities. So stuff like Sturdy, Pressure, Sunny, the drought ability for Ground and Kyogre, that was introduced. The Double Battle was also introduced, which no one cares. This time, however, instead of it being one evil organization, there was two. It was split, Team Aqua and Team Magma, which was honestly a cool feature to split it into two evil teams. And for the story, change somewhat based on what version you choose. It was a cool change. And then, obviously, new Pokemon. And then, this scene. was almost the same game that scene people if you were a kid growing up you're playing a Game Boy Advance under the sheets when you shouldn't be and you should be asleep and you see that scene that resonates with you just seeing Rayquaza 
be a fucking dad and just tell the kid, Hey, you better fuck off. I'm turning the Xbox off. No one's gonna play Call of Duty after this. <laughs> better behave, I'm taking away the Xbox. If Emerald gets a remaster, I hope that scene comes in 3D. That'll be sick to see something like that in 3D today with modern graphics. Diamond, pull on platinum, baby! Gen 4! This is some people's favorite generation. For one, okay, this is gonna take some explaining, in which I don't want to explain. So I'm just gonna say that the physical and special classification of moods were different. For example, bite before this rework, that was a special move. Of course, now it's a physical move, but before it was special, it was weird. But they fixed it, so now bite moves like bite are physical. Secret bases, which no one cared about. I don't know why, she had a calculator function. That way, kids who play Pokemon can learn how to calculate stats and become sweaty Pokemon nerds, figuring out the optimized way to use moves, calculate attack damage, calculate defense, calculate the way to get some bitches. <laughs> Basically, the wash birthed Pokemon nerds and taught them math. It taught them, hey, this number actually means something. Of course, that had a new Pokemon. Then there was Team Galactic, which arguably is the most evil organization in the in the series. This is just Strip said, hey, you know what? What would happen if I just, you know, rewrote reality? <laughs> he actually turned into a Thanos. He was Thanos for us kids. Reality can be whatever I want. In this case, I'm gonna destroy this reality. <laughs> and then Platinum came. Platinum didn't offer much change other than guaranteeing his involvement in the story. But then we all know what happened to Guesses afterwards, and we full on dove into this Dorshan world. That was honestly one of the sickest maps we've seen in Pokemon. With reality just not making sense, us climbing up and down walls, vertical waterfalls, water hanging upside down, floating objects in the middle of the air. It was a sick scene to just watch Giratina emerge. Stop against this, and then we just jump in there and catch Giratina. But even though we got Giratina on our side, I don't think anything could have prepared us for what happened next. I can hear the sounds now. The keystrokes. The strings being pulled on the piano. War is something that people look down upon. We avoid that shit at all costs. It causes harm to everybody. No matter what, in war, everybody loses. The people who make it out of war get PTSD. And for us Pokemon fans, that we get PTSD from a fucking piano thanks to Cynthia. The Cynthia fight in Diamond Pearl Platinum is arguably one of the most hardest fights in the entire series. There's a reason we fear the piano. It evokes fear in our hearts. Reminds us how many times we soft reset the game just to beat her fucking god charm. For a token kick to just be able to tank any attack, Spiritomb just didn't have any weaknesses back in Gen 4. Fae type didn't exist, so he just sat there being type neutral against everything while he sucker punched you and just tanked your hits. He couldn't kill him. He just couldn't. There was no. It was. Uh, it's arguably one of the hardest fights in the series, and that's why. Pokemon fans on instinct sweat when we hear a piano. Thankfully, this is gonna be the last time you're gonna hear a piano in, in the video, so y'all can rest. I won't trigger your PTSD anymore. Hot Gold Soul Silver. For me, this game holds a very special place in my heart. This was my first ever Pokemon game. And with that, the fucking Pokewalker, baby! Bro, I didn't still have that sh That shit was sick. I remember when I caught my holo, I walked around with that shit all the time, taking it wherever the fuck I went. That was my childhood. Hard Gold Soul Silver was a sick game. And it was a great one for a reason. In this game, Pokemon followed you. Such a simple change, and yet it made such a big difference for Pokemon being able to follow you around. Gen 2's fans stay winning. But, unfortunately, this was the last time you see it for a long time.
black, white, and black, white too. This is honestly what people argue as the one of the peaks in Pokemon. Of course, we got new Pokemon. Of course, we got triple battles and rotation, which no one gave a shit. In the Dream Radar system, we were able to catch Tornadoes, Thunders, and Landorus, which it was cool, but we just rather catch them in game. Seasons! Look at that! Pay, don't pay attention to read Dream Radar. Fuck that thing. Seasons. The seasons change in game. Whoa! Now that there's snow here, so you can access a new area that wasn't available before. Check that out. Just promise me you don't change the in-game clock to time travel, you know? Just don't do that, please. It ruins the immersion! We also got animated sprites in the uh, Black White series. Do you see Pokemon be able to move that kind of quality? Well, it's honestly a big change. You see them move around? Well, it's a big deal. And it was kind of a foreshadow for what was to come next. More on that in a second. Then, we got arguably the best story... No. This was the best story in all of Pokemon. It brought up a moral question which in the series has not been brought up before. It is also one of the most hardest games in the series. I remember struggling a lot in Black White 2 with Elite 4. I almost beat that shit first try, but then my game crashed. And then it took me months to be able to beat Elite 4 and Champion. Anyways, now that the Black White series is over, I think I'm just gonna chill on this out. Oh for fuck's sake, Piano! X and Y. X, Y was the biggest jump in Pokemon we've seen. Full on 3D game. New Pokemon. I, the first time a new type has been introduced. The fairy type since Gen 2. We got Mega Evolution. This was the most speculative I've seen Pokemon be. Ever. In which, sure, I may not pay attention that much until XY, but the fake leaks were all over the place with XY. Who was that new Eevee evolution? What type was it gonna be? What's his new Mewtwo form? The speculation was through the roof. What kind of new Mega Evolutions is there? Who else is gonna be a fairy type? What new Pokemon is there gonna be? And yet, even though the game made substantial jumps, it was arguably easy. For one, they changed the EXP share to be team wide. You don't have to have. Okay, so how the EXP sh share works beforehand? It was a held item. You gave it to one Pokemon, and they got the experience. Nobody else. But in XY, it's a key item. You just turn it on and off. Actually, no, it wasn't even that. It was just auto on. No matter what, all your team got distributed EXP. So you didn't need to grind up your Pokemon to be good. They just casually got strong in the background, which made the game substantially easier, which the battles were also kind of easy. And then Team Flare was also introduced, which is another evil organization, but we we used that pattern as Pokemon fans. And then Oraz. Sugar Ruby Apple Sapphire was the game a lot of people asked for, and su somehow, surprisingly, we got them. It was a faithful Ruby Sapphire remake, but introduced everything ex up to XY introduced. So new Mega Evolutions, and that's about it. That was pretty much it. It was arguably the easiest Pokemon game. You got Latias or Latios, fairly easy. You got Groudon Kyogre was pretty damn powerful. Mega Quasar was so damn overpowered, even though you got him late game. People considering banning him across the game in competitive scene. Even I knew of that. It did make up with a Delta episode. This was one of the coolest post games in a Pokemon. And to be honest, I wish we got to see more of Xenia. And don't forget that soundtrack. But to be honest, Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire introduced to Hooper Rings, which you literally flew around on Latias and Latios. To just be able to fly around in the region and then just go through those hoops and catch on legendary Pokemon. And they could be Shiny Hunt too. That was important. That's important right there. Shiny Huntable. Anyways, it's time to move on again. Sun, Moon, and Ultra Sun Moon. They added a lot. They added, first off, they added regional formats for the first time. So, that rat over there? Ah, uh, yeah, nah. That rat's actually on fucking fire, baby! They replaced the, tr the original system with gems with trials, which honestly was another cool change. Z moves, no one gave a shit. No one gives a shit. Nobody, everybody laughed at Z moves. 
But in Sun Moon and Ultra Sun Moon, that was the smallest deck save added to a Pokemon game. That was the smallest Pokédex they've ever added. The least amount of Pokémon they added to a new generation. And that's not a bad thing, but when you consider the fact they revealed almost everything about the game, all the Ultra, almost all the Ultra Beasts, almost all the Legion of Forms, almost all the new Pokémon, all that was left to be explored was a story and Z moves, in which those fell flat as well. And it's not like there was an evil team to pressure, pressure us along to do the story. Team... What was it called? I, for, I even forget. Team Skull. Yeah, it was Team Skull, which was basically a bunch of gangsters. Oh, but plot twist! It was actually the Aether Foundation all along! I mean, we can kind of see that plot twist coming a mile away from the interesting they literally do. Spoil that we shouldn't really trust the Aether Foundation, but we get the move. We stop Team Skull from doing whatever the fuck they're doing, and then we move on. That wasn't really a story to introduce. And oh yeah, <laughs> now we're jumping to a wormhole to find an alien species. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, that's that's totally that's totally a reasonable jump in story progression. Stopping a team of bandits and people just doing gangster things. Okay, yeah, sure, whatever. Oh yeah, now we're stopping an alien species. What the fuck? Sword and shield. This was another jump in the series. For one, of course, we added new Pokemon, but then we got Dynamax. Which seemed to try and play, replace Mega Evolution, but it just seemed worse. It was temporary, and it just made your Pokemon big. Sure, some Pokemon got cool forms, maybe some cool signature moves with it, but it was just... Chunky. Hey, we need... Okay. Junichi Mashita is expecting us to pitch a beautiful new concept for this game. We need a new niche mechanic. Last time, it was Z-Moves. People hate that. What do you got? Uh, maybe you just bring back Mega... No! We need something else. You, in turn, say something. And there he did it. He opened up Photoshop and made Pikachu big. That intern got paid that day. <laughs> I'm not going to say Sword and Shield was a bad game. Sure, it may have reduced the Pokédex, so not all the Pokémon were available. Sure, the story was kind of iffy. It followed the same thing of Sun and Moon where, oh, there's these gangsters, criminals, just doing whatever the hell they wanted, not doing anything bad, but they're just being annoying. Do now you have to save the world or else your mom is going to die! I'M JUST A FUCKING POKEMON TRAINER, WHAT DO YOU WANT ME TO DO?! Sword and Shield somewhat saved it in the end. For one, they introduced DLC, which was not seen before, and honestly I don't want to see it again as paid DLC. It should just be something that should be added on. It was cool to see new Pokemon, Pokemon that didn't make the first cut, being able to make the final cut with the DLC. It was cool to see new areas. The Galarian versions of the legendary birds, that was cool. New Reggies? Sick! DLC was were cool, but I wish it was just with the original base game. But it made up for the fact that later on, Pokemon were allowed to follow you. That was a good change. We have not seen that in a long time. That in itself was worth forking up the money just to have Pokemon follow you. Okay, Masada, we need your, we need your guidance. People are not buying the DLC, they're not giving in. What do we do? Just make Pokemon follow you. The also introduced dens, which is basically just wormholes again, but it said you have to do multiple battles, and you have to work with the team. And Zygarde was fucking OP, holy shit! I'm skipping Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl because no one gives a shit about those games, but... Legends Arceus was a highly anticipated game when it was announced. And for very good reason. From when the trailer was released, it was a Pokemon fan's wet dream. An open world Pokemon game. You run around in the wilderness to catch Pokemon. You throw your Pokemon out to do shit. It was what we wanted all along. And because of that, there was high expectations. And they fought them pretty damn well. Pokemon follow you as long as you send them out, which... That's all you need. That, that in itself moves the game in A+. 
Good job, Masada. Good job. They introduced a few new Pokemon in the form of new variants and just being able to evolve them. Well, if you exclude that Tornadus motherfucker, that Enamorous motherfucker that it was, I don't. Stay away, stay six feet away from me. They introduced Strong and Agile style, which, compared to Dynamax and Z moves, that was a cool mechanic to be able to change up the battle system and introduce a mechanic because, like, like. <laughs> strong and Agile style. Fuck me. The strong and agile styles were a cool change in pace compared to Z moves and Dynamax. Even though it was simple, just being able to change your attacking order and sacrifice speed or power, it changed how the game was played and it made it fun. That is what we're looking for in a in a for a niche move system. That's what we're looking for. Sure, it moved abilities from the game, but it was a Actually, one of the best games we've seen in a long time. Sword Shield, Sun Moon, and XY didn't really live up to the hype it fully expected to some degrees. It was they were good games, don't get me wrong, but compared to something like Black and White, Gold, Silver, Hot Gold, Sword Silver, Platinum, it just pales in comparison, and that was due to the difficulty, partially. That. In a sense of urgency, let me explain. In Pokemon Legends of Arceus, you try you you have no idea. God just summoned you like an Isekai character and said, Hey, you know what? Save the world. And once you do that, I'll let you catch me. You know what happened in Sword Shield? You just fought gym battles and then save the world. You know what happened in Sun Moon? You did these trials, which are basically gym battles replacements, and save the world. That's why you did it, but it was just all over the place. And then difficulty. Because they reworked how speed worked in some of the statuses and battle system, it was actually difficult to some degree. For one, you had to actually complete some of the progress in the game. You had to catch Pokemon, complete your Pokedex, which honestly some people just forget about and don't care about. Making it required to progress in the game is a smart move, and honestly, it would have been a very different game if it didn't require that. And even though there was no multiplayer, the fantasy battles where you just throw shit at Pokemon was also a cool way of changing how you defeat opponents. It was a challenging game. There were some fights where I had to do certain strategies in order to win. But it was it was harder than most, but still easier than some. Thankfully, it didn't change. Wait. What the fuck was it? I hear it. Why do I hear it? Why do I hear it? Oh no. The fucking piano. Why do I hear Oh you son of a bitch. Volo. Volo <laughs> I love Volo, but I saw his patrol from a mile away and yet when I heard that piano, my genuine reaction was to turn off the game and walk away in fear. Step one for surviving as a Pokemon fan. Run at the sound of a piano. At first, I was fairly confident in my abilities. I had a Dialga. I had a pretty souped up team. I didn't really lose any battles throughout the entire game. I never really came close to losing either, but I was confident in my abilities. So, what was the worst thing that can happen is what went through my mind until I heard the piano. They knew what they were doing when they introduced that piano and made the entire battle theme for Volo. They knew what they were doing. And then... <laughs> oh! You beat Volo! It wasn't as bad as I thought, okay. I actually somehow survived that with relative ease. Okay, cool. So why do I... So why do I still hear the piano? Why do I still hear the piano? Oh yeah, he's like seven Pokemon. It's fucking Garatina. Oh yeah. And he has a move that can outspeed you. And oh yeah, he can dodge your attacks. Oh yeah, he has plus one to all his stats. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, and he, can, he can't heal between, so it's a 6v7 basically. That took a few tries to that took uh, That took a lot of time to beat. A few tries, and I finally beat it. 6v7. Ball is down, Giratina's down, and oh, what the fuck? Why do I hear boss music? <laughs> It's so cool. 
But I just shit my pants in fear. So, what Volo basically did was give you Cynthia's team and gave her two Giratinas. <laughs> this is the hardest Pokemon battle in the game. Not because of the difficulty in the team, sure. People who live and breathe competitive Pokemon have done a competitive analysis of a team compared to other trainers and see how strong he was. But what made it difficult was the change in the battle system. I wouldn't be surprised if they changed the battle system for this boss fight in particular because Pelasis doesn't work the same. Because guess what? Sleep doesn't work the same. It's only a chance for you not to do damage. You don't build cards with them successfully. They're just drowsy now. It's not full sleep. They're just drowsy. Freeze? Oh, guess what? It's not chip damage. It's not the worst status condition in the game. You can try and put it on fire, poison it, but it's still a super team. So unless you have ability to stall, it's still gonna sweep your team, and it does a shit ton of damage. <laughs> oh yeah, and it can invade that attack that allows you to gimp it. It's very hard to gimp a Giratina, which is why it's such a damn difficulty to beat it. Oh yeah, and it can move multiple times in a row. Yeah. At least with Cynthia, you got hit with Garchomp's Earthquake once a turn. Imagine getting hit by Cynthia's Garchomp twice in a turn with two Earthquakes. Yeah, that was basically what I was like to fight that. Giratina. Not fair at all. God rest your soul, Volo. I hope to never fight you, your descendants, ever again. So that leads us to now. What what do I expect from Scarlet and Violet? So, for one, I expect a decent story. Not good. Not exceptional. Just decent. Two, room for difficulty. This doesn't need to be a hardcore game like Reborn, Rejuvenation, or Kaizo Emerald where you have to sweat your balls off, but being able to not be able to sweep the game in just one day will be a helpful change of pace. And just cool new Pokemon. And also, don't reveal everything, which they've been doing a good job of. So, I don't, for Pokemon, it's been evolving for a long time. We went over a lot of things, but we don't need a lot of change. Sure, change is necessary when you introduce a new game to the series, but we don't need to redo. We don't need to make the wheel again. We don't need to reinvent the Pokeball here. Some new Pokemon, maybe some new items and features, new story, and for the most part, it'll get some people by. We didn't need to replace Mega Evolutions with Z moves. We didn't need to replace Mega Evolutions with Dynamax. Strong and Agile style was unique to Legends of Arceus, and I don't think it's going to make a comeback, either. They make a new niche mechanic, and they throw it away the next generation. That's how it's been for the last three. And I won't be surprised if that happens with the 4th gen. They forget crystallization, and they make a new niche mechanic for that new generation, Gen 10. At least, I'm not going to say what we want, because I don't speak for the entire fan base, but what I want, and Scarlet and Violet, is not innovation. It's polish. And it looks polished. It does so far. Just from the trailers and what we've seen and what we know about the game. It's polished. It's a mix of Legends of Arceus and it's a mix of what we already know. Sure, it is might fall under that trash pattern we've got for the last two generations. We go, oh, see this? Team that's basically doing nothing and just being annoying? Well, plot twist. He's a real bad guy. I don't want that. I want actual bad guys that we have to face as well. As long as we get some sense of danger and urgency in bad guys, I think Scarlet Violet might go down as the best game. Well, see y'all on launch day. Oh yeah, actually we have one more fader. Please don't bring in Volo Cynthia. I don't want to hear the piano again. <laughs>